I don't know about you, but it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. It's good to worship. It's good to feel God's presence. And it's good to get into the Word of God. We are on session eight this morning, and now I'm transitioning about from talking about God. How many know in the last seven weeks, we've dealt a lot about understanding God? If you understand God, it makes your theology a whole lot better. Because there are some attributes and some absolutes that we've got to establish by God. And once you understand those and that they are unchangeable, God is immutable, then you begin to realize a lot of what's being portrayed from Christian pulpits today are dealing with a different God because it's not the God of the Bible that we have attributed to him attributes of pagan deities and try to call that Jesus. How many know that's not the way it is? And not only have we done that in our theology about God, we've also done that in our, in our understanding of man. If you understand why you're here, you can understand a little bit more and you can find some fulfillment in life. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to go to Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26. And this is probably going to take us two, three, four weeks, five weeks, because I need to, to build an understanding of why we're here, what we're supposed to be doing, the fall, what happened with the fall, and God's remedy for the fall. Because I'm seeing a lot of things in the body of, of, of Messiah that's alarming me, that when we see the price that God paid and what God wants to do, he declares he needs to do open heart surgery. He's got to give us a new heart. And what we have been accepting are Band-Aids. A Band-Aid or a vitamin shot and calling that redemption. That's not redemption. And so to understand the need for redemption, we've got to understand how it all started. We've got to go back to the beginning. And we need to understand that God made man in his image. Now let's read this starting in verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, I want you guys to remember last week. I know that's just a little bit of a stretch. But when we begin discovering how, who God is, we found out that Hebraically, repetition shows significance in the Hebrew. And that it was, and the holiness of God was brought to the superlative. It was brought to the level of three, which is the highest that you can get in Hebraic expression. That God is absolutely holy and that all his other attributes must bow their knee to his holiness. But if we don't read carefully here, we miss a point. That the number one major attribute or primary attribute of man is that he was created in the image of God. It is repeated three times in two verses. Almost to the place of monotony. If we were writing it today, we'd just say, God created man in his image, gave dominion. But what, God, why is God adding that repetitively? It's like looking at creation and God says, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. What, what, is that, what does that show us? That shows us that God's commandments bring creation, that God's commandments bring order out of chaos. And God says, you're so dense, I've got to repeat it seven times. And so man is created in the image of God. That's our primary purpose, is to display Almighty God in our lives. The word in Hebrew translated image in Hebrew as shalim, which means image or images. It can be used for semblance. And then God goes on to talk about likeness. That likeness is demuth in Hebrew, which means likeness, the likeness of or similitude. That God, we are to reflect God in the earth. One of the reasons that we're a bipedal being is because so is God when he takes corporeal form. God never shows up anywhere in the Bible with the head of an eagle or his head in his chest. The reason your head's on top of the neck is because that's where God's is when he shows up in material form. The reason that we're bipedal, there, there is Semitic uh, perfection, there's symmetry 
in the makeup of man because we, we're, we're, we have the same on both sides which gives us dexterity, which gives us movement in the realm that God gave us dominion over. Just the same way God, in, in his symmetry, he's perfect to take dominion over everything he created. There, there is that there. Now, when I first began to uh, put this together, I, I, I was thinking, well, what, what should I go into? Because right here, most evangelical theologians go into understanding the Trinity by the tripartness of man. And let me tell you something. The tripartness of man almost goes to ad nauseum, that we're spirit, soul, and being. Did you know your brain is not one brain? It's three brains. There's actually three brains that make up the human brain. That we... There, our soul is made up of the will, mind, emotions. We have the conscious, subconscious, and unconscious. We can get into Freudian psychology, and you have the ego, superego, and id. You can go into transactional analysis, and you have the parent, adult, and child. It's just over and over and over and over again, yet are you three people? Sometimes people make you wonder, but no, they're supposed to be one. God is one, but yet he has manifested himself as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit as three witnesses of himself in the earth. We do not serve a pantheon. There are not multiple gods in heaven. There is one. No more than there's more than one of you in the earth. Simply because you have spirit, soul, and body does not make you three individuals. It makes you one whole person. And I could get into that. I can also get into that some people say since we're created in the image of God, that God made us little gods. No, he did. He did not make us demigods. Some people are striving for that. That's the lie of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that you shall be as God. It was not enough to be like him. It was we wanted to be completely like him. When man, we were created to bear the mark are the image of the one who created us. That's our destiny. That's our purpose. When man lives his life from the position of what he was originally created to be, his life gives glory and honor to the one who created him. There is where you find fulfillment. There is where you find meaning. We say, well, how do I do that? Well, how many know that God is creative and God is almost unlimited? So the variety among us you can look at mankind. How many know that hardly two of us look alike? What does that show? Well, the geneticists would say it's just the, disp you know, the dispersion of the genetic gene and then how it mutates over many generations. No, it's the creativity of God. And God says, I, I want you to remember that you're not superior in yourself. That's why he made some white, some black, some yellow, some red. No one race is superior over the other. They're all simply an expression of who God is. But to get an idea of really what we need to understand about man being in the image of God, we have got to go to the wisdom of Jesus. Let's go to Matthew chapter 22 this morning. Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. And this is about render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God's what is God's. And this entire discussion really is not about taxes. Really, it's not. Now, they tried to make that about that, and Jesus actually brought a higher understanding if you understand the Torah. Picking up from verse 15, the, uh, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel that they might entangle him in his talk. So they went out unto him, their, uh, they sent unto him their disciples of the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Now, right there, wouldn't that be great if every preacher did that? You don't respect men, you respect God. Tell us, therefore, what, thou, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Now, right there, we need to understand that there's something called rhetoric. Rhetoric means the way of speech and winning arguments. And what they just placed Jesus in is called a rhetorical, uh, rhetorical jeopardy or a rhetorical dilemma. We see attorneys use this all the time. Mrs. Jones, answer yes or no. Well, she's damned if she do and she's damned if she don't because they set her into a rhetorical dilemma that no matter if she answers yes or no, they won't allow you to give an explanation. Have you ever seen an attorney do that whenever you watch the movies? Just yes or no. Well, either way they answer, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to 
fall dimly on him because if Jesus said, yes, you should pay taxes, how many know taxes since the beginning of time have never been popular? Okay. Oh, no, Jesus wants us to pay taxes. And then if he said, no, we shouldn't pay taxes, then they sick the Romans on him. We got him now. We got him entangled in his words. That's why it says in verse 18, but Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought to him a penny. And he said unto them, whose image is on this an inscription? And they said unto him, Caesar. Then said he unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God. And when they heard these words, they marveled, i.e., they were blown away. And they left him and said, I ain't going to mess with him anymore for a while. You know why? Now, I've heard preachers get up and say, right here, Jesus covered tithing and taxes all at one time. That's not what he's dealing with here. You can say that if you don't understand Genesis. You can say that if you don't understand Torah. He pulled out a coin. All Roman coins bore the image of Caesar. Therefore, all currency actually belonged to Caesar and could be used for his purposes. Just like in America, we have presidents most of the time. I don't want to stick something weird on there. But they also have United States of America inscribed on it. That means that that currency belongs to the United States of America and that we are given the, the right to use that currency as the nation or as the state deems appropriate for its use. If they say that this is not appropriate for that use, since it bears the image of the state on it, you can't use it for that. Did you know that it's illegal to, to mar the image on a coin? It's illegal because then it blurs who it belongs to. Okay. All men, to include Caesar, who was on the coin, are stamped in the image of God. So he was saying, you may have to give your money to Caesar, but you better give your lives to God to include Caesar. Because even Caesar himself, who declares himself in Rome to be a god, in reality, has the image of God stamped on him and he will have to give an account to the true king for what he does in life that's part of what that means that that image that stamp of that image of the creator gives me authority to operate in this realm but also i am responsible to him for what i do with the image that he's given me Thus, the main reason that man was created in the image of God was because man belongs to God and that man was to be used for God's purposes in the earth and to bring God glory. That's what it means to be created in the image of God. Now, for the scientist, and God has made us bipedal because it represents who he is. He's created three brains and one brain so that we could understand his three witnesses and all the threes that, that we can go through that, that create the, the soul and the psyche of man was so, all us, uh, so that we could all understand that even though God has manifested himself as one, as three, he's yet one. You want to know the real reason for that? Do you know that God, now, now, this, 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 this is deep. God has to abide by his own word. He's got to abide by his own law because that law is an expression of who he is. He will not do anything contrary to his own nature. Therefore, there are things that God cannot do. God can, will not tempt a man with evil because he cannot be tempted with evil. The very, Bible's very clear on that. God cannot sin. He will not sin. He will not violate who he is. And so when, as, as, as he does these things, his word says that everything has to be established by two or three witnesses. But if you understand the Torah, it requires eyewitnesses. Who can testify of God to man as an eyewitness of God? 
only God can. He has revealed himself to man as a witness in the Father. He has revealed himself as a witness of himself in the Son. And he has revealed himself as a witness to himself as his spirit in the earth. And that's even encoded into the Shema. When you really understand the Shema, it's, it's Shema Israel, uh, uh, Yahweh, then Elohinu, which what does that mean? That, that, is a, that is a singular version of Elohim. It's another variant of Elohim. And then Yahweh is Echad. So the Shema is Hero Israel, God, 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 is one. But yet the middle one, the Son, is singular because he manifested himself in singular form for us to be able to touch and to hold and to realize. But at the same time, God says, if you dismiss the Son... You still, have, you still have a perfect witness in the Father and the Holy Spirit. Therefore, God's witness of who he is in the earth remains. It's a perfect witness because you can dismiss the Holy Spirit or you can try to dismiss the Father, but yet you still have a perfect witness of two bearing witness to who he is. Isn't that good? We also need to understand that if... One of the things that God just kept on this dealing with me this week about and and when God really starts talking to me I know it's time for me to start listening I mean uh, you know a lot of times you, you know people got to go out in the woods and, and try to hear God I'll just be doing something and I've noticed when God starts talking how to stop I kind of wonder about that and I know why, why why does you know why do women have to go out into the woods and get quiet to hear God that's because they're a human being that there's something they've got to be being men are human doings and so usually in the doing God starts talking and then he can Kind of, okay, now my, new, my, now my new doing is listening. And so I started listening, and God began to, to just bring up stuff that I've, I've heard in the past from different speakers. And, and one of them was from an uh, internationally acclaimed motivational speaker named Brian Tracy, who and there was a series he did on Success Mastery Academy. And what they have discovered in, in the science of motivation and the science of success it is, did you know that within you there is enough potential that if it was fully released, it would take you 100 lifetimes to fully live out. 100 lifetimes for the potential that's in you. And that's if you live to be 80. Brian Tracy goes on to say, and he's noted for this quote, the potential of the average person is like a huge ocean unsailed, a new continent unexplored, a world of possibilities waiting to be released and channeled through some great good. The greatest unexplored territory in your life is the potential that God has put in you. Why? Because you're created in his image. As I began meditating on that this week, and the Holy Spirit began to really just talk to me about the greatness that's in man. And I go, God, what I see around the earth, I don't see great. Because we automatically equate, equate great with good. And this is what God told me. He said, I place within man the potential of greatness. That greatness is unique to each individual. The fall did not change this potential. It only tainted the products of greatness. Man can be a source of great joy or great pain. A source of great justice or injustice. A source of great truth or deception. A great leader that brings prosperity or a great tyrant that brings fear and poverty. A great blessing or a great disappointment. 90% of the time it's one or the other. I don't know about you, but I want to move from the great disappointment to the great blessing. Isn't that kind of what God did with Abraham? He said, come follow me, and I will make you a blessing. I'll, I'll, I'll take you from a great disappointment compared to what you can be, and once you allow me to do the work and truly release my image in you, you're going to be a great blessing. Now, when we think of greatness, we think of the world stage. Forget about the world stage. Who cares about the world? Quit thinking about the world. How many know that for a woman, one of the most wonderful things in the world to be is a great mother? Or a dad to be a great father? There, there's, there, there are levels of greatness that we have not. If we're going to be one, why not be a great one? 
If I'm working on a job, why not let the image of God flow through in that job to bring him glory? There's creativity that can come out of us in that job that can transform the workplace and become a blessing for that workplace. That's how you become invaluable. And I think even the way that we have, we have done things in America, how many know that labor unions originally were a good thing in America? They protected the worker because the workers were being taken advantage of in a serious way. There was a time in America with the way that business was run, if you're working in a food plant and you were doing something and you fell in to the vat, then you were simply 200 more pounds of product. Do you know that? I'm disgusting, but when you look back at the early 1900s, that was the attitude. If you fell into the cement, they didn't get you out. They didn't try to figure out a way to keep guys from falling into the cement. That the, the elite were basically treating everybody as slaves that your lives didn't matter. And so, yes, labor unions were good, but somewhere along the line they've become socialistic. To where now once you get in the union, you don't have to perform, you don't have to have greatness and add worth to that place. And they make it almost impossible to get rid of you. That's why we have teachers who don't teach. We have workers that don't work. We have guys making $30 an hour that all they do is haul around Cardboard boxes. How I many know oh, holding around a cardboard box is not worth $30 an hour? But what it's also done for that individual is there's greatness there that Satan has put a system into place to destroy the greatness. Because what I have found out, guys, number one, when Satan, when man fell in the garden, another image was stamped on him, the image of Lucifer. And so Satan says, either I'm going to get you to extend the greatness that God has put within you for my purposes. That's where the great evil, the great, the great pain, the great injustice can come in. If he can't get you to do that, he will wrap you up in the bondage of being mediocre. Mediocracy is actually an affront to God. It's like taking an atomic bomb and turning it into a firecracker of, of, what, of what is in you. Now, as man, I cannot allow Lucifer to use what God has placed within me for his purposes. Yet he does it all the time. Do you know that most psychics most likely would have had a calling to be a prophet in the body because they're sensitive to the spirit realm? We have great orators that are hailing the dictates of Lucifer from podiums that were probably called to bring men to Jesus. That They're calling them into socialism. They're calling them into whatever movement. And they're leading them astray into great darkness when their call was to lead men into great light. Because Lucifer cannot give a gift to man. He can only pervert it and try to stamp his image over it and to use it to bring great disaster. You see, that's kind of what happened in the garden. That, that greatness was there. That image of God was there. And the moment that Adam fell, that image of God in him was marred, and he became in the image of Lucifer. And Lucifer became the god of this world, little g, because of the fall. Now, I want us to look at a couple of things. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Now, this is talking about the temptation of Jesus. And how many know that you can't tempt Jesus with something that wasn't real? It had to be a real temptation. Now look what, look what Lucifer told him, starting in verse 8. And again the devil taketh him up into an exceedingly high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and said unto him, All these things will I give thee. Well, you can only give them to somebody if you own them. You know, Chad's got a nice truck outside. I can't go out there and grab the keys and give it to Micah. It doesn't belong to me. That would be an unlawful promise, wouldn't it? There'd be no temptation in that. Micah, you have no, no way are you getting Chad's truck today. 
I cannot tempt you with an offer of Chad's truck because it doesn't belong to me. The moment this came out of Lucifer's mouth, Jesus would have said, stop, you're a liar. It doesn't belong to you. But it did. Because of the fall, Lucifer took the authority and the dominion that God gave to man, and he used it to lord it over man. That was the purpose of the fall. So we have that. We also have Jesus when he's, when he's teaching on the devil. He said that, uh, he said, you're like your father, the devil. He's lied from the beginning. Like your father, you see, a son is cast into the image of his dad. There's always a resemblance there that you can see because the, the spiritual DNA was there. And so what happened at the fall, there was a spiritual DNA that was stamped, superimposed over the image of God that marred the image of God in man, and it became distorted. That was what Satan used in heaven when he distorted worship and brought it to himself instead of God. He didn't create worship. He distorted it, made it into something else that made it his. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the Apostle Paul tells us, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them who do, which do not believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. I think it's, I think it's neat. Christ is the Messiah, is the image of God. He, didn't, he had never had, there was no sin in his life, and so there was never the overstamp of Lucifer in his life. After today, you're going you're gonna to see image in a whole different way or being conformed in a whole different way after today. That Jesus was the only one before, since before the fall that Satan had not marred the image of God over. That's why he's called the second Adam. In the image of God. Here are some thoughts that I, I wrote down about uh, on greatness. The saint cannot get you to express the, the attribute of greatness for his purposes. He will attempt to lock you into mediocrity. Mediocrity needs to be your enemy. I don't care if all you, all you do right now is dig holes, be the best hole digger on the planet. Know it better than anybody else. Because if you can... If you can show forth greatness in that, there's promotion for you. Mediocrity never brings promotion unless you're in, um, what do you call it? You see, there, there are some systems that promote stupidity in the earth. <laughs> I remember when I was in the military, I had some guys that were E8s, not, not because they were worth, worthy of that promotion to E8, it's because they simply lasted their time where they were so old that they kind of We've kind of seen that in the corporate world, but they're the do-nothings. They may have a title, but they have no power. They have no authority. They don't really do anything. How many know there, there's, there's, no, there's no bringing God glory there? True promotion in life comes when you allow the Holy Spirit to release the greatness that God has within you to bring Him glory. And that when you bring such an excellence to the workplace, and they want to know why, it's because I believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I walk with God. God declares excellence in my life so that His image can be portrayed in me because I have found out that work, when it's done right, is worship. When I work according to God's commandments and according to God's ways, God accepts it as worship to him. And for a lot of Christians, one of the reasons why God can't accept their worship on the weekend is they don't worship him in their work all week long. There's no, there's no excellence, there's no dedication, there's no commitment to truth in what they do. If you're going to do something, do the best of your ability and then try to improve your ability. I'm amazed at, you know, what, what's interesting. We, we, we think of Judaism as a Western culture. It is not. It is an Oriental culture. Most people don't realize that it, it, it draws from Eastern type of culture. 
The Western culture is Greco-Roman. And so when, when you look at the Orientals, one of the things that I, I find real interesting, how many know economically in a lot of areas that uh, uh, the Oriental nations are kind of kicking our, our rears as far as industry? Con you know, America is no longer a product productive nation because the unions and, and, everything, and the unions and the corporate world is crank it out, crank it out, faster, 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 faster. I want 100 today, I want 200 tomorrow. And how many know when you do that, there's no, there needs to be a craftsmanship in what you do, no matter what it is. There has to be a craftsmanship so that excellence can go through. And I, I read a story one time, this guy went to uh, Japan because uh, he, he was investigating the, the company that he worked for made pianos and was really world famous for making pianos. And they were losing their market to Japan and, and couldn't figure out why. And so he went to Japan to study what they were doing, and, and there's a, a big frame that, that's on the inside of the piano that's first cast, and I mean, you've got to grind it down, you've got to do all these things to it to prepare it for them to, to mount it and everything. And so when he went in there, and he's used to, you know, our factory, uh, one guy can get out 10 of those a day. You know, that, that, he, he took pride in that, 10 of them a day. So I want to see how they're beating us on this. So he goes into the factory, and he said, full rain, just come, talk to anybody you want to. And uh, so he goes, and one of these guys is working on this. He says, how long does it take you to finish one of these? And the guy looked at him like, are you nuts? Until it's done. I might do 10 today. I might do five today. Whatever the metal requires to get to perfection. If I just do one today, as long as it's perfect, I've done my job because he was a craftsman. And the guy says, well, who's your supervisor? And I looked at him and he said, why do I need a supervisor? When I'm done, it's perfect. That's what they want. Because I'm a craftsman. It's not speed, it's quality. Because it's in the quality and in the excellence, now drawing from that, it's in the quality and the excellence that the image of God is revealed. I mean, sometimes we can look at art or we can look at things of beauty and there is a level of excellence that becomes awe-inspiring that you look at that and you can sense God. You have never done that to a piece of junk going down the road that barely holds together. Have you? Because in bringing out that greatness and taking the time, not only to take the time in the workmanship of what you do, but taking the time to develop the expertise. Do you know how you can make your, where you work at? Do you know how you can increase your job security? Become the go-to guy that has the answer and gets it right. The guy who knows how to get things done. The guy who understands the system or understands the software or understands the purpose and the vision of, of that business and that you are the one who can get figure stuff out when nobody else can. And what will blow them away is when you stop and say, let me pray about it this afternoon. And then you come back tomorrow with the answer that none of them or all, any of their PhDs could figure out how to get it done is because you allowed the excellence of God and communing with the Holy Spirit to bring that greatness out of you because the only time that the likeness of God can be stamped in you is when you spend time with him. Believer. That's why we need to pray over the workplace. We need to pray over our homes. We need to pray over to bring that level of excellence. Because if we don't, that image will stay marred. I don't want to bear Lucifer's image on anything that I do as a believer. Let me tell you something. If we would just get this concept, it would eradicate about 95% of the sin out of your life if you become image-oriented, not your image and the perception of what people have about you, but the perception of how do people see God through me? They can't see him through you when you're cheating. They can't see them through you when you're lying. They can't see them when you're fudging the system or just getting by. It's in the things that we allow the Spirit of God to bring excellence into our lives that God is manifested. But you know that not only was Jesus the image of God, 
He came to restore that image in you. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Verses 29 through 32. And I want to ask you, how many times have you read this and never taken it back to Genesis? How many times have you read these verses and never taken it back to Genesis when, God was, when man was created in the image of God? For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed into the image of who? Jesus. And who is Jesus. He is in the image of God. That man, and that man can see Jesus and touch Jesus and see him through the writing of the Gospels and to see him moving in people's lives. And for the first time maybe in our lives, we've got back in our minds what God looks like when man is stamped in the image of God. It's not just to... Re Jesus didn't... This did not come, guys, to reveal the Father to us. He came to reveal to us our lost selves. That when I see Jesus, I see who I can be in God when God's image is stamped on me. Nothing he did was to ever prove he was God. Nothing. Every time they challenged him, prove that you're the Son of God. Prove you're this. But he wouldn't do it. But he constantly went about doing good and destroying the works of the enemy because that is what a man in the image of God will do. A man in the image of God will live the commandments. A man in the image of God will keep the feast. A man in the image of God will bring joy and bring healing to a place. And then we are predestined. Martin Luther, this, this, this fried his brain. He couldn't, he couldn't understand what, what this was talking about. Since God foreknew you, foreknew exactly what you were going to do, that predestination of being conformed into the image of Christ goes all the way back to the garden. When God made man, that was a manifestation of his predestination. God always goes back to plan A. I'll give you a couple examples. When God showed up on Mount Sinai to the people of Israel, they all freaked out. And so because they freaked out, they backed up he had to go to plan B, the Levitical priesthood. He said, that, he said, I would that you would have become a nation of priests. But he had to go to plan B, Levitical priesthood. Now once Messiah gets here, we are, we're, we are no longer of the Aaronic priesthood, Levitical priesthood. We are after the order of Melchizedek. And what's a very poor translation in Revelation 1, where it says that he has made us kings and priests, Revelation chapter 1, that is not what it says in the Greek. They couldn't wrap their head around it. It literally says he has made us a kingdom of priests. Because that was plan A. God told Israel, you're going to keep my Sabbath. If you don't, my land will rest every seven years. And if you don't, I will make you do plan A. And so both when the northern tribes and the southern tribes went into captivity, it was for the number of sabbatical years that they missed. God always goes back to plan A. Jesus said, I have come to take back what was lost. I've come to seek that which was lost. Three things were lost. Man, authority, and the image of God. Three things. Hmm, three. Three things. Not only did Jesus go to the cross to get you back, he not only wanted to get you back, he wanted to get back your authority in the earth, and then he wanted to get back the image that really belonged on you. You see, if you get a piece of money, and it's got Bobo the Clown on it, how many know that may be funny money? And we're walking around trying to move an authority in the earth with funny money. Because the wrong image has been stamped on us, and we wonder why the authority don't work. Have you ever seen believers that try to move in their authority and cast out demons, and they end up being like the seven sons of Sceva? You can't cast out a devil when you have the image of his king stamped on you. See law. 
You can't tell the devil, devil, I bind you up when you, when he has, when you have in Lucifer I trust across your chest. It just doesn't work. He says, I see. That, that, that's, the, that's the whole reason we're told not to make idols. Because idols and icons express a spiritual reality. And that, so any, any time that, that's, that's one of the, one of the pro, has been problematic for missionaries going overseas and they bring back trinkets. So they bring back occultic images of other gods and masks. And, so, and then they wonder why all oh, hell broke loose in their homes. It's because when that demon sees the image that represents it, it says, I get to claim that. And so if you have a graven image, then your household, the image that that thing represents, gets to claim it. Now, you can call it Bobo the Clown. You can call it whatever you want. Hell doesn't care because you can't change the original meaning. That's why we can't change feasts. We cannot take a pagan holiday, put God's name on it, and now say it belongs to God because the, 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 where it originated expresses the spiritual power behind that. And every time you do that, you attract other spirits in that belong to that feast or belong to that image or belong to that engraven thing or that idol. And if we don't allow Messiah to stamp the image of God on us, what do we attract? Trouble, 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 trouble. I mean, we're just a country western song looking for some place to happen. <laughs> Why is the devil always picking on me? You're wearing his t-shirt, dude. But when he starts to see his image marred and the image of God restored, you start walking in authority. He begins to hate, because having the image stamped is an open door. We're always talking about open doors. Do you know that you can I'm, I'm, can, I, can, I, can I throw out something that's problematic? You can keep the feast, try to keep the Torah, but if your heart has to stamp a jealousy, pride, envy, hatred, you still have given the devil an open door because you're going through the motions, but you don't have the image stamped on you. It's the old saying, you can dress up a pig and put lipstick on it, sure don't make it a woman. You always got a pig. And when you let it do what's come natural, it will show you that it's a pig. We have a lot of people in the body of Christ right now that have the image of the devil that's still stamped on them because they have not really experienced God. And they cause confusion and chaos and wounds and hurt because there's pigs in the parlor. And they're doing what comes naturally. But once you have... God began the process of restoring the image of God on you. Everything, the, that, everything of the kingdom that that image represents begins to move into your heart. And it is a process. But I, I want you to, to, to read this, and this, this is so wonderful. For whom he did foreknew, for no, he did also predestinate to be conformed into the image of his Son, that he might be the first foreign among many brethren. Moreover, I like that word, moreover. That means I'm getting ready to add to it. Don't you like it when God's, God says, I'm going to get ready to add something to this? But God, it's so good right there. Just to know that I've been predestined to be conformed into the image of God. I like that. But he says, you know what? I'm going to add, so I'm going to add an, an extra heap and helping, as we say in the Ozarks. God's getting ready to add a heap and helping to what he's going to do. Moreover, for whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he, will, he, will, them he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? God's got my number. And because I've truly surrendered to Messiah, he is going to begin restoring his image in me. And it may be a process. He may have to work on me to get me to let go of some things and then work on me to take hold of some things. But I have, am reassured that he will justify me, that he will call me to do it, that he will put the things in my pathway to do it. 
if I've surrendered. You've got to surrender to the potter's hand. What's the potter doing with the clay? He's restoring the image that should have been there. He's restoring the image that should have been there. That's why Messiah's got to come as, as, as a, a, a fuller soap and as, and as a refiner because he's got to restore that image within us. Well, what shall we say to these things? Believer, if God be for us, who can be against us? I imagine the Apostle Paul kind of, because I mean, he, he sometimes uses uh, the Roman soldier, like in Ephesians, he uses the Roman soldier to show our, our armor and stuff. Well, see, the Roman soldier had a crest right here on his armor. So if you messed with the dude with the crest, you messed with the kingdom that backed up that crest. You can't, guys, don't, uh, now don't do this. Don't walk up to an FBI agent and slap him in the face. Because the full wrath of the FBI will come on you. You're going to get this in a minute. You didn't walk up to a Roman soldier back then and spit on his face because of the image that was on his chest. Not that he was a train killer and that he could take you out probably with his pinky. He didn't have to worry about that because of the image that was stamped on him. That entire kingdom would move if you dared come against the authority that he was under. And so if God be restoring his image on me, who can stand against it? Because the moment I allow Jesus to begin restoring that image on the inside of me, when Lucifer comes at me, he becomes the problem of Jesus of Nazareth. God will start fighting for you. Now that is the ultimate spiritual warfare. We all want to learn how to do spiritual kung fu, you know. The devil shows up, whoa! No, no. You get to the place where that image is stamped there. God's got a sniper angel that nailed him before he even got around the corner to get to you. Oh, I don't believe that. Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. That's God fighting for him. Let me tell you something. People around you, if they start getting blessed because they bless you, when they start talking bad about you, that all hell breaks loose in their life, they'll know to keep their mouths shut. What about grace? That is grace, Jack. <laughs> that is grace. That's why the Word says that every, every, every tongue that rises up against you, you will condemn. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Why? Because God will fight for you. Now, we've not really gotten to the place where God fought for us because we've never been taught about the image. I want to have the name of God and the kingdom of God on this breastplate of armor. The righteousness that comes from Messiah, not in me, but in him. And I am predestined to have that image restored. Sometimes that image used to, and years ago, used to say, kingdom of darkness. And sometimes I wonder if it didn't say, me. <laughs> but now it's saying kingdom of God that I belong to Yahweh Elohim because of what Messiah has done for me. And the more clear that image becomes, the more threat it becomes to the devil when he comes against it. Notice in the, in the book of Genesis, he could not do a direct assault on Adam. He had to come through under the wire. A direct assault would not work where the image of God is emblazoned. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall not he with him also freely give us all things? How many want to get into some of the all things of God? The only way you can do that is his image has got to begin being stamped on you. Because the more the image is stamped, it begins to call to the things of that kingdom. That, that, that's going to that's gonna kick in here in a minute. 
How many have ever felt like a bad magnet? Bad magnet, weirdo magnet, stress magnet, <laughs> whatever kind of magnet. It's because we've allowed somehow or another for the devil to mar that image and it's calling to other things. When we allow the Lord to work on us, that he begins to reform our hearts, all of a sudden we begin to find that the kingdom of God is always what's attracted to us. So much so, the Apostle Paul warns us, and I'm going to end with this one. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Now notice this is still in the book of Romans. So the same Paul who wrote Romans chapter 8. Now guys, this, this is really going to get complicated. The guy who wrote Romans chapter 8 is the same guy who wrote Romans chapter 12. So maybe he's still talking about images. I know Christians have a real hard time circumnavigating chapter markers. Have you ever noticed that? Especially when you get into 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, you start talking about the Lord's return. They cannot connect the rapture with the Valley of Armageddon, even though it's in the same paragraph almost. Why? Because there's a chapter marker. And what even makes it worse, if there's a page in the middle of your Bible that says New Testament, that is the chasm, that is the Grand Canyon that cannot be gone over. But that's the mindset we have. And so for some people to realize that when Paul was talking about restoring the image of God in our lives in chapter 8, he's continuing that same theme in chapter 12. Because the way the Apostle Paul writes, that was three paragraphs later. He, works, he, works, he, he does things worse than I do. I, I mean, the guy could go 15 pages before he gets to a period. And so it may be one thought. Okay, so let's look here in verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now what's he talking about? In our lives, the image of God is supposed to be stamped. And the only way you can do that is you've got to lay down on the altar for God to beat the image in. Everybody went, <gasps> Yeah. When I crucify the flesh, that crucified flesh is, is exchanged for the image of God. So he's talking about the same thing. And remember he said, do not be, we, we, are, we are predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ. He's going to use the word conformed again in this exact same Greek word. And be not conformed to this world. Don't let the world try to stamp its image back on you. When God says, listen, when, when, God, when God looks at you and says, God, I'm giving you my life, restamp your image in me. I lay down my life for your image to be restamped in my life. God calls that a reasonable service. That's what this is talking about here. It's called being a sacrifice on the daily installment plan. God, where in my life today do you want your image restored? Where this week do you want your image restored in my life? It is progressive sanctification because when the sanctification process is complete, you have the image of Christ stamped in you. And he says, in this process, I'm begging you. That's what beseech means. Guys, I'm begging you because of the mercies of God. Where? At the cross. Because of the mercies of God. Let God stamp his image back on your body, on that which represents you in your life. And while you're doing that, make sure that you don't allow any part of your life to be reconformed into the world. Now, he gets into talking about a transformation, a metamorphosis. In fact, if I believe right, this Greek word is metamorpho in the Greek. It, it metamorphosis. That a metamorphosis will take place as you are renew your mind to the word of God. That all of a sudden, the more you renew that mind, you get the old stamp out and the new stamp in. You no longer have mark of the beast here. You have holiness unto the Lord. 
that mindset by renewing our minds to the Word. And we're going to get, I don't know if it'll be next week or the week after, when we begin studying about the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, every tree has seed. And when Adam and Eve took of that fruit, it scattered the seed in their minds. And so there were seeds of darkness scattered throughout their soul. Their spirit died, was cut off from God, and their soul was filled with seeds of darkness just waiting to be watered and to sprout it out. And so as I get into the Word, it begins to wash away those seeds. That's why I have to have the washing of the water of the Word to wash out the old seeds because the water of this world causes darkness to spring up within our minds. But the water of God washes, kills them and washes them away. And as I begin to allow God, every day I lay down my life and I say, I will do what this word says. I don't care if I feel like it. Because right now part of the old image is trying to rear itself up. And, and I, I, I want to act out of the old me, the old man, instead of the new man. I want to act out of the old image instead of the new image. And God says, crucify that, lay that thing down on the altar. And then go back and renew your mind to the word. And as I begin to wash away the, the, the seeds of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I experience a metamorphosis in my life because a new image begins to be stamped on me. Now notice what he says about this. When I get to that new image, he says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, that you may give evidence. That you may give evidence. What is the good an acceptable and perfect will of God. Perfect will of God. Not His permissive will. Perfect will of God. As I allow that image to be stamped on me, I'm going to move for that which is permissible. Permissible means what I can get away with that won't kill me. You know, and there is a sin unto death the Bible talks about. The New Testament talks about. And we dance around that border calling it grace, grace, grace. No, the God's saying, listen, <laughs> dummy, you're dancing on the edge of death. Won't you get over here? out of my permissive will, and I'll get out of plan B and come back over here to plan A. You see, the church decided to do plan B, and that was to let Rome guide us. How many know that has not worked out well? Maybe you ought to go back to Jerusalem. Just, 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 a, uh, maybe just a thought. Maybe since it started there, we ought to go back there. How many know when Jesus returns, he's not going to sit down in Italy and say, Amore! I want spaghetti and meatballs. He's going to sit down on the Mount of Olives. The Bible is explicit. The book of Revelation, there's only one city it sets on seven hills on the planet. Rome. All roads lead to Rome because Jesus said there are many ways that lead to death. There's one way it leads to life. Plan B, Rome, that had not worked out well. That's got us so far off, we can't even see start. But as I allow his image, I get back in the Word and find out that the entire Word of God, guys, it starts in Genesis, not Matthew. And there is a continuity throughout all the word. And it's about if, if I walk in God's ways and I temper the flesh and, and make it do the right thing and to, and to crucify it when it doesn't want to and ask God to give me strength, he'll begin changing. See, it's that old image trying to come up. Anytime you get in the flesh, that's that old image trying to exert itself. And once it exerts itself, it loses that image into the spirit realm which calls the other kingdom in. See, this, this is ground-level spiritual warfare. But when I allow his image to be loosed in my life, all of a sudden, to those around me, I become living proof of what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. I become a testimony because I have his image stamped in me. And in the days ahead, that is going to be paramount because prophecy is getting ready to hit the fan and where, and where the prophecy flies and how it flies because in the prophecy there are those that are going down and there's going to be those that are protected. And the prophecy is going to fly based upon the image it sees on the man. Yeah. 
Selah. And it doesn't matter so much what's coming out of your heart. It matters the image that your life bears. Because you cannot have Lucifer incorporate out of here and try to talk to things of God and not have the kingdom of darkness come and hit you in the chest. Because it is drawn to that spiritual icon. Let me tell you something. When a Christian, a believer Messiah, actually discovers the commandments, the authority, and the ways of God and starts walking in them, it begins to show up in the spirit realm. That's why those demons, that when the seven sons of Sceva tried to cast them out, we cast around the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. Doesn't that sound really good? Sounds really liturgical, doesn't it? Let me get you a little holy water. The devil says, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. All I got to do is look over in the spirit realm and I can see the image of God stamped on him. But when I look at you, all I see is H O M E. I see my home. And I'm going to be the master of my home. And therefore, since you came against me, I'm going to whip you from one end of this town to the other. And they did. Because those were those boys were the boys from the wrong hood. That that see if we get this right and understand this concept, when you pray in the name of Jesus, you'll start asking for different things. Because you'll ask based upon the character of the name not what your flesh wants. When you come against the devil and you say, I come in the name of Jesus, and he sees Jesus tat, you know, right here on your armor, he's because you, we don't realize what God gave us was his armor. That's his image. That's his armor. Unless you open the visor and do something goofy, he's, you know, it's Jesus coming at him. How many know that you're gonna, it's going to be easy to stand? Because your armor is complete. But what we have done, we show up in our BVDs and an old stupid stick, and we think we're going to do spiritual warfare. I've been to a seminar. <laughs> Devil shows up in full tactical gear, and you're sitting there in your BVDs thinking, I'm more than a conqueror. No. That image has got to be forged back onto us. It was lost by receiving a lie. It can only be regained by receiving truth. That's why the Apostle Paul said, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so part of the task of a believer is not necessarily become culturally Jewish. How many know that the Jewish culture is a wonderful culture, but it's like any other culture not over, over the millennia? We have some things that are of God, some things that aren't. But how many know they usually have more things that are of God than the church does? It's about being like Jesus. It's about restoring publicity. We're going back to the Word. It's about seeing His image stamped on you. Is what's going to give you authority. And when the devil comes at you, you do the Word. He has no defense for the Word. If you do the flesh, that's his territory. That's where we're headed because we're getting ready to see a division from those that are real, those that have, that have, uh, that have, that have become that living sacrifice that allowed God to restore that image. We're going to see the difference between those and all the pretenders. That's why there's going to be a great falling away. You know, I've kind of wondered, if the, you know, we, we kind of see the falling away. and we, I've kind of think it's already begun, and you can sit at church, and the whole church kind of fell away in a lot of areas. But I think, too, that great falling away is when the prophecy really starts hitting the fan. Who are real and who are fake are going to, are going to separate. There's going to be that falling away from truth. Because what they're doing doesn't work. And so they'll amalgamate into whatever works. And what the only thing that's going to work separate from God is the Antichrist system. You've got to receive that mark. You've got to receive that mindset. You've got to pledge your allegiance to that to survive if you're not fully stamped with this over here. 
I want the real. I don't want veneer. In the kingdom, I want to be mahogany all the way through. I don't want to be cheap furniture in the kingdom. I want to be a vessel of honor that's real all the way through by realizing my call in God more than anything else is to have the image of Christ embedded into me. Everything else in your life is secondary. Everything is secondary. But when you get that, everything else begins to fall into place. Father, we just come before you this morning in the name of Jesus. Father, we just thank you that you have restored an understanding to us about your image, what it means, its purpose, how it relates to spiritual warfare and in every other area of our lives. And Father, as a people, we commit ourselves today. We choose to yield to the begging, the pleading of the Apostle Paul that we give our bodies as a living sacrifice. It's holy and acceptable unto you, Father. It is our reasonable service. And we choose to obey what your word has said over and over again. We will meditate in the Torah, the law of the Lord, day and night. It will make our way prosperous. We'll have good success. It will transform us because of what Messiah has done for us. And Father, let us receive it with gladness that we may become proof and a testimony of who Jesus really is. And we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name.